I've been reviewing speakers for four years here, four years or so now. And uh, in that time, I have measured quite a few studio type powered desktop monitors. Now, the smaller ones that I've measured have all been garbage. I mean, just straight up garbage. I'm talking one note bass wonders, extremely boosted high frequency, mid range suck outs of seven decibels. And that's actually two recent ones, which one was the PreSonus Eris version two or Gen two and the Fio Fio SP3. It's really frustrating as a reviewer to not have a product that you can go to when asked and say, yeah, this is what I would recommend. So I'm finally, seriously, finally happy to be able to recommend the Cali LP UNF. At $300 per pair, you get Bluetooth, you get RCA input, TRS input, and you have USB-C input, which is super nice when you want to connect it to a computer. It's super duper easy. Check it out. See, look, and here's the back of it. You got all these little inputs. Now you notice you got a bunch of little dip switches too. You can actually tailor the sound to fit what you need in your situation. Are you going to be listening to Freefield out in a room somewhere? There's a switch for that. Are you going to be listening to it on the desk? How close is it to the wall? Is it within half a meter? There's switches for that. Do you want to boost the treble 2B? 2B? 2B or not 2B? Do you want to boost the treble 2DB? Do you want to drop it 2DB? There's a switch for that. And there's a switch for dropping the bass as well. I'll show you some of those measurements in a little bit. All right, now it's connected, okay? Look. It's, it's blue right now. I'm going to drop the, the volume. How cool is that? All right, it's the little things that impress me the most. That's not what she said. The, oh yeah, I'll show you the other thing too. See this little dude right here, this little output? That is a cable that runs into the secondary monitor. Now you don't have to have an IEC cable to power up the secondary monitor. It's all done through this additional cable. So you power up the one monitor via an IEC cable, just, you know, a regular 120 plug. And then that secondary cable routes to the other monitor and looks like this. It comes with a one inch dome tweeter at the top in kind of like a waveguide profile and then a four and a half inch midwoofer and it is ported. But how does it sound? It's the best desktop monitor I've heard so far. Within reason, like Cali makes an LP6 V2, I think they're $400 per pair, and it's a six inch mid bass driver. And then I've heard other larger desktop monitors. And although this one is on the larger side compared to something like the Fio SP3 or the PreSonus Eris 4 and 3, it's a no brainer to get these. Not only do they sound good out of the box, not only does it have USB-C input, but it has those dip switches where you can make adjustments to tailor the sound for your listening position. They are not designed to be super loud. They're designed to be about arm's length away. And as a matter of fact, the instruction manual says 0 0.8 meters listening distance is recommended. So the maximum SPL that I was able to achieve out of these in my anechoic testing is about 91 decibels through the mid-range and then beyond. But overall, the sound is just, it's awesome. I mean, what? A 300 bucks powered monitor, USB-C input, RCA input, TRS input. I never use TRS input, but if, if that's what you need, you've got that as well for balanced. Biome! I mean, seriously, they sound good. It's, ah, I'm, I'm forcing myself to come up with things to say because they just sound good. Now in my situation, I'm sitting close to the desk. These speakers actually have to be out in front of my monitors because I've got two monitors right here to do my video editing and things like that. So I have to bring them kind of out far. In most cases, if you had just one monitor, you can push them a little bit further back. Because they're a little bit closer to me, I'm sitting a good bit above them. I'd say I'm about 40 degrees above them. And for that reason, I actually set the dip switch setting to enable a 2 dB boost in the high frequency because I noticed that when I'm sitting up higher above it, I do lose some high frequency content. But that little switch resolved that, then I got back all the detail and the resolution and all those fancy buzzwords for treble, 
that I needed. And it wasn't bright. It wasn't overly bright or anything like that. It just sounded neutral. It's a very good neutral sounding speaker that you should be able to go to go to create good mixes on without having to worry how well is my mix going to translate or to listen to music on your desktop, to play games on your computer, those kind of things. And matter of fact, if you wanted to, you could hook them up to your television set. You know, if you've got a smaller room, they're not going to get super low. About 50 hertz in room is probably about the lowest you're going to get. And again, they are SPL limited. But if you want something for a nice set of television speakers in a small room, not at loud volume, they would do the job for that. The one thing that they do miss, though, is they don't have a subwoofer output. And I kind of wish that they did because Cali makes some pretty awesome subwoofers. They've got their, I think it's the W6.2 that I reviewed months back. I'll try to remember to drop a link up here for it. That's a fantastic subwoofer for about 500 bucks. Now that subwoofer does have the ability to set a crossover within it and then route signal out to these mains. So really, instead of having a subwoofer out, I think what you would want to do is you would want to get that Cali and then route the signal for the mains out into these. All in for about 800 bucks. That's a fantastic system. And I can't think of anything that I would more easily recommend for just these or for these plus that subwoofer. These speakers were loaned to me by Cali Audio directly for review, but I wasn't paid or anything like that. And I think as far as drawbacks go, I don't have any. I mean, you're going to see in the data that it looks really good, even for anechoic measurements. But on a desk with the proper dip switch settings in place, I have a hard time saying that word dip switch and following it up with another word sometimes. But with the proper dip switch settings in place, I can't imagine that you're going to be saddened by what you hear. Again, for 300 bucks, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Buy this speaker. If you've got 300 bucks and you're looking for a desktop monitor that's not huge, buy the speaker. <laughs> you know, like I'm not trying to shill. I'm just saying, I don't even think I have affiliates links for these because Amazon doesn't sell them and neither does Crutchfield. So it is what it is. They're just good speakers. So now let's just look at the data. I'll give you a quick run through and, and give you an idea of why these speakers are so good. Up first is the on-axis frequency response. And I want to note that per the manufacturer, the reference axis vertically is pretty much where this bar is. It's supposed to be between the tweeter and the mid bass driver that's below it. So put your ear in line with this bar. That's kind of the ideal position. Now, obviously I'm not able to do that because they're sitting down here. And in my case, I just boosted the treble and you may have to play around with some of the dip switch settings to get them to do what you want to do. But this anechoic data at least shows us that we're starting off with a very good baseline. With the F3 down at 54 Hertz, you're going to get good kick drum out of these. F10 is at 39 Hertz. So once it gets down to around 40 Hertz, it's going to start rolling off pretty rapidly below that. But again, I don't think that if you're buying these, you're not buying these expecting a whole lot of lower bass. In that case, if you need it, supplement it with a subwoofer. This is the CEA 2034 data set. Looks good to me. I mean, even the ERDI looks good through here. There are some ripples going on, but I don't think you're going to hear any of those issues. Estimated in-room response is calculated at two meters listening distance. And there are some attributes such as floor, ceiling, side wall, rear wall, and back wall reflections that are accounted for in the estimated in-room response. And typically every far field measurement that I do from the main listening position in my living room or my bedroom or wherever I'm set up to listen to mains, closely matches the estimated in-room response above about 500 hertz. And below that, that's where the room itself really is predominant in terms of the effect on the response. Now, I say all that to say that these speakers are designed to be listened in the near field, about 0.8 meters away, arm's length away from you. So this estimated in-room response can be a little bit misleading in how it's dictating or, or telling you what you're likely to hear. Most likely what you're going to wind up hearing is the on-axis frequency response, but I still include this just because I think it's useful to know what's going to happen, what the tonality is going to be like in the far field. And with that in mind, this looks pretty good to me. If this speaker were $2,000, I might beat up on it a little bit more due to this resonance, this resonance right there. These are so narrow though, that I don't think you're going to hear those. It's going to be more smoothed out in your audible listening. 
300 bucks for a desktop monitor that measures this well so far is unheard of, by me at least. This is the horizontal contour plot, about plus or minus 70 degrees up into about eight kilohertz or so where the tweeter starts to narrow in radiation. In terms of the vertical response, where do you need to be placed in respect to the reference axis, which is the midpoint between the tweeter and the mid? Well, according to this data, you can go around 30 degrees or so, maybe 40 degrees, depending on if you're going above or below that reference axis. Of course, you do have this narrow band Q dip in the response as you go below that reference point. And if you go above that reference point, there's gonna be a peak there. But overall, I'm actually kind of surprised that the vertical radiation is as wide as it is because most two ways are usually within about plus or minus 10 to maybe 15 degrees. But then again, this is a small mid range to a one inch dome tweeter. So they have a little bit more room for error. They're able to cross this tweeter down to 1900 Hertz, which helps these two drivers act as more one source point and give you a more broad vertical dispersion, which is helpful because again, they're gonna be close to you. And if you sit up rather high, you're gonna to need to keep that in mind. Distortion at 86 decibels, it's below 3%, that's pretty good. Distortion at 96 decibels does increase above 3%, but again, 96 decibels at one meter is really not the intended target for the speaker, so I'm not too plussed by this. Multitone distortion shows us that at 96 decibels, it's right on that 3% line, but keep in mind that really and truly, this isn't hitting 96 decibels. There is a limiter here, and we're gonna see that in a second. So your actual measured output SPL is closer to 91 decibels. These down here represent 70, 78, 88 decibels, give or take, and it shows us that at these output levels, which are not limited, the distortion is low. This is the compression that I run for electronics measurements, because sometimes just a sine sweep measurement for compression doesn't really convey how the limiter is acting. So the multi-tone compression testing that I do is probably more accurate for active designs, power designs that have a limiter built into them. And we can see that my target SPL for this guy is around 96 decibels. You can learn that by going to my website, aaronsaudiocorner.com. And what we're seeing is about five decibels of compression. So if we take off five decibels from 96 decibels, then we get 91 decibels at one meter, that's the maximum SPL for the one speaker. But when you add another speaker to it, that adds in another six decibels. So that's it. I mean, honestly, that might be the easiest review I've ever done. You know, if you want me to talk about how it sounded, the best I can tell you is that it sounded like a neutral desktop speaker should sound. It doesn't accentuate anything too much. It doesn't cut anything too much. It's well within a good linearity, at least objectively speaking. And then when you actually put it on your desk and in the room, you have options to change the characteristic of the sound in ways that will improve it, you know, because the desk isn't, isn't going to help you a lot. So in certain ways, it alters the sound to make some improvements. And with that in mind, actually, let me show you a couple things. This is the response in black, what you just saw a minute ago, on-axis response. But if you flip some of these switches for the on-desk, so green, we have on-desk greater than a half a meter. And then blue, we have on desk less than half a meter. So we can see that it does make some changes based on you placing it on the desk. And then if you wanna make some adjustments to the bass and the treble, this is what you have. So black is the standard response that you saw previously. And then purple is boosted treble and mid. Orange is cut treble and mid. There's not a lot to it. It works and it sounds really good. Best desktop speaker that I've come across thus far easily recommended by me. If you're needing something, check it out. I will talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.